Hello, hello, hello. How is everybody? How are you guys doing? Back again. Um, this next panel, or this next speaker, I should say, sorry, that's what my brain has been, is um, somebody that has always captured my imagination. She is truly one of the greatest minds of our time. We're in the nature bar. And if you're going to be in the nature bar, we want to have people in here who are going to talk to you about nature. And if there's one person that talks to nature and understands nature and listens to nature, it's Janine Benyus. I'm super excited for this. If you're sitting on the outsides and you want to come in here, I would recommend sitting in here. Really pay attention to this talk because it's going to blow your mind. Janine Benyus. Hello. How many people know what biomimicry is? Have you heard about it at all? Oh, good. Good. It's, um, it's innovation inspired by nature. It's seeing the natural world as a mentor. Next. It's seeing organisms like this. This is a, a toke gecko. And there's a, there's a place in the, in the United States, uh, University of Akron, where they study this gecko. And this particular gecko is called Catherine the Great. Um, and the reason she is called Catherine the Great is because they have developed an incredible respect for this organism that can reversibly adhere, climb up walls. You could suspend 140 pounds from this gecko. There's no glue. Because of how elegant this organism is, they have developed a respect. And that's, I think, the most important part of biomimicry. But let me show you what we're learning from these creatures. Next. So those bristles are on the ends of those toe pads. And each bristle it doesn't have any glue. It just goes into the nooks and crannies of a wall. And it adheres through van der Waals forces, the smallest force known. But when you add it up into billions, it's very strong. And then peels away. Why is that important to us? Why would we care about that? Because the stuff we make is glued together. And that's why we can't recycle it. What if we could put it together for its time that it's used and then, like a gecko, reversibly adhere it? And that's, people are learning that. It's called geck skin. Go ahead. So biomimicry reminds us that a sustainable world already exists. It's the conscious, and I mean conscious, emulation of 3.8 billion years of life's genius. There's a lot of bios out there, biotechnology, synthetic biology. So when you ask bio what, biomimicry is very different. It is not domesticating organisms and having them do for you what, that's called, you know, that's called bioprocessing. We've been doing that for a long time, milk from cows, beer from yeast. It's not that. It's not extracting it's not like a wood floor. You extract the wood and you use nature. It's not that. It's not harvesting or extracting or domesticating. It's learning from. And that's a very, very profoundly different paradigm. For 250 years in science, we've been learning about. Learning from is a whole different way of approaching the natural world. It's also viewing and valuing nature in a whole new light. Let me show you two stories here. One is that pitcher plant. That pitcher plant, insects go in, but they can't crawl back out. There is an amazing, in the throat of that plant, there is an amazing technology. I think of it as a technology tool for living, which now people are mimicking so that we can put that onto the hulls of ships to make them move faster without as much fossil fuel. It's called slips technology. And the bat, quite maligned right now because COVID jumped, that coronavirus jumped from a bat, we think, to humans. But the fact is, who's studying the bat? 
Bats have been living with coronaviruses for tens, hundreds of thousands of years. There is a small group of scientists that are studying the bats. Their immune system does not react like ours does. Ours overreacts. Theirs does not. What is the difference? So when, you, when somebody asks you what's biomimicry, say, we should be asking the bats about coronavirus, how to live with coronavirus. So we are surrounded by genius. Take heart in that. This is John DeBerry from Stanford. And he and his students were trying to find more efficient wind turbines. So of course they went snorkeling. And they went into water because flow is flow. These, when fish flow in a, in a flock, they throw off little spirals. And the ones behind curl their bodies like in a hydrodynamic sail, and then they get flung upstream. That's why trout can swim so beautifully upstream in a school. If you put wind turbines, horizontal ones, in a grouping, which would be really good for cities, the wind turbines behind start to rotate because of those little vortexes even before the wind hits them. It's five times more wind power than a horizontal axis wind turbine. Right? CO2, the poison of our era, to, nat to the natural world, it is not. It's an ingredient. It's an ingredient for these coral reefs, dissolved CO2. They know how to make concrete out of CO2. And plants, of course. This is Brent Constance. So he studied coral reefs, figured out the chemistry, and now is making road aggregate and concrete out of CO2 and dissolved um, brine from, say, desalination plants. So the minerals in the water combine with the dissolved CO2 just in the same chemistry as the coral reef recipe. So sequestering CO2 in the biggest building material that we use, the most frequent building material we use, Blue Planet and Calera. I'm going to show you a little, some companies here. And that's from brine. And we've got a really nice combination. If you have a desalination plant, you have a lot of brine, which is a waste product. It's got a lot of minerals in it. You take CO2, you combine that, and you can make buildings out of that. Here's another underwater creature. This, these, these are for the explorers. Um, humpback whale has these interesting, see the scalloped edges on the front of it? Those scalloped edges are there for a reason. It's an acrobatic organism. It does this incredible bubble feeding. It comes up into a spiral, right? And then as it's doing it, it's blowing bubbles in a column up, which, which contains the krill. And then they all go underneath and they come up and with their mouths open and eat that krill. This is Frank Fish, real name. Um, even though it's a mammal, but he's creating wind turbines, which have those scalloped edges on them, 32% reduction in drag, which means that wind turbine can be in very slow wind speeds and still operate. Even systems. Sequestering carbon while nurturing life. There's a guy named Bren Smith. Do you guys know this guy? Do you know him? He's amazing. He's doing this permaculture underwater. So he's doing these kelp farms. Unlike um, aquaculture that where you have, you know, you have um, salmon and that are in cages, this is an open air situation. They basically are creating kelp forests and then growing um, shellfish along with that in an open situation. It actually changes the chemistry. It restores the, for the um, sea water around these kelp forests. And he's, take, he's trying to get people along the East Coast, chefs along the East Coast, to begin to love kelp. Because it's a great, great, it's five times tropical rainforest sequestration of carbon as well. Bacteria are not something, are actually mostly good, sometimes bad. How does nature manage that? Sharks. On their skin, there's these dermosoles, they're called, and they're, they're these little diamond-shaped um, parts of their skin. 
and bacteria just don't like to land on them. So there's a company called Sharklet that makes thin film technology that doesn't kill bacteria and doesn't breed for resistance. Light. Um, cold chemical light in luminescence, we still don't know how to do. That's still a holy grail for us. But there's a really neat, um, interesting technology for LED lights. On the lanterns of these fireflies, there are little tiling. On the second picture there, you can see a little tiling. Just that shape creates 55% more light from an LED light, from a current LED light. They've been at this for so long. It's the largest R&D lab in the world. 3.8 billion years, pa parallel innovation, with one thing in mind, one consistent measure of success. This is the difference. In our R&D labs, what's the measure of success? Next quarter profit, how much market share we can grab, how cheap we can manufacture it, cheaply we can manufacture it. The one consistent measure of success for every innovation in the natural world is this. Is it good for the chicks? Will, how will the chicks fare here? It doesn't matter. Nothing else matters but the continuity of life. So I would suggest that's our design brief. So we are at a cusp and looking for solutions. But strangely, ironically enough, they are all around us. It's literally a matter of us being, having the humility to ask nature for advice. Asknature.org is a, I'm going to tell you a, a few of the things we do in biomimicry in our organizations, in our nonprofit, the Biomimicry Institute. Our job is to democratize learning from nature, not to make it an exclusive realm of lab coats but rather to have any inventor anywhere in the world be able to put in a function, asknature.org, put in a function, how does nature filter salt from water, and up comes the glands of seabirds, right? Up comes mangroves. Check it out. And at the moment of creation, to be able to access these technologies, Believe it or not, it's very, very difficult to find these technologies. It's not even the way biology is taught. It's not taught by function. But this, this site is organized by function. We're trying to organize the world's biological intelligence. There should be a BIS, a biological intelligence service, as well as a GIS. The difference between learning about nature and learning from nature you would see an oak tree in a, in a textbook and it would tell you how tall the mature tree is or how many acorns it produces. It's used for furniture, veneer, wood. It's a use paradigm. Learning from nature, you're learning about the fact how the canopy humidifies air, how it creates the rainfall for, for us, how the limbs are structurally able to cantilever out in a way that our architecture still hopes to do with minimal lightweight materials. That idea that you're learning from, it's a different stance. So these are the sorts of things that you can find on asknature.org. Um, there's technical things. There's also things about how we organize ourselves as a community. How, how does nature collaborate? How does nature communicate? How does nature network itself? How does nature form enduring partnerships? So check that out and contribute to it, too. The other thing we're trying to do is allow people to practice biomimicry. And we're trying to nurture a, a, a network of entrepreneurs who are doing this kind of work. Uh, we have a thing called the Ray of Hope Prize. And uh, 
with, we look for small businesses that are, um, that are using nature as their model. And then we help them, we help them become known to the world and hopefully get financing and hopefully break through that valley of death and actually um, bring you something that you can start to choose and sort as consumers. Toxic materials, color, pigments are one of our biggest issues. Morpho butterfly does this with structure. Right? Um, light goes through the structure, the nanostructure of the morpho butterfly, and it comes back out as this color blue to your eyes. I'm just going to tell you about a few of these prize winners. Next. All of these, all of these critters have, have light creating the color to your eye. There is no pigment in any of these organisms that you see. It's structure. So there's a company called Cypress Materials. They're creating a spray that creates color um, without having to paint. Impossible Materials looks at a white beetle, and that white is not a pigment. It's not titanium dioxide. It's not mined. It's chitin. These folks are using cellulose and putting it together in fibers. When light goes through it, it creates white to your eyes. Cellulose instead of mining for titanium dioxide. These folks are doing uh, the seawalls that we're all going to be doing in, adap in um, adaptation now. Um, those seawalls should be welcoming life. They should be, and th this is called e-concrete. They, they're marine biologists, and they figured out, you know, basically what corals like to land on, uh, what other sea organisms like to land on, and they're creating those, it's called habit texture, creating that habit texture for those organisms to land so that that seawall is bristling with life. It, it, it's better at calming waves, but it's also just, just better for the, for, the, for the ocean and for us as well. Next. Light weighting is a huge, huge thing that life knows how to do. Um, this is a mantis shrimp. And the club with which it breaks open its shellfish prey has this amazing helicoid structure. We're mimicking this now. With non-toxic materials, we can make non-toxic materials that normally would be weak by laying them up in the same structure as the mantis shrimp, we can make wind turbine blades that are stronger than anything we have now that then can biodegrade at the end of their life. Spintex, same thing with fibers, fashion. Why are we using hydrocarbons? Why are we using oil? Because of the, materi because of the material properties. Well, spider silk has an amazing material property. And it's made out of flies and crickets. The trick is in the processing, the nozzles. So these folks from Oxford have figured out, and this is over, this is, these are, this is science of decades. They've figured out, and now there's a company, how to take a, a liquid from common waste proteins, squeeze it out at a particular pressure, the way the spider does, and make incredibly strong biodegradable fibers that have the same technical characteristics um, as these polyesters. So if anybody says to you, we need to use hydrocarbons because they have better material characteristics, send them to Spintex. Photosynthesis is done with light. It's chemistry with light. It's not heat. New Iridium, a, another winner of uh, the Ray Hope Prize, um, is using low energy chemistry with light. So it's a whole new chemistry regime. Desalination from mangroves. There's a company called Aquamidate. And they're making filters that filter, that do forward instead of reverse osmosis where we push water against a membrane. They use forward osmosis like you use in every cell of your body, little proteins called called um, little hourglass-shaped proteins called aquaporins that pull water through, escort water through. And this company has figured out by watching diatoms how to actually make those filters. 
So our job is to make this kind of wisdom, because that's what it is. It's knowledge that has been honed and perfected in place. It's embodied wisdom. Make that available to everyone right now is what we need. So our, our task at the Biomimicry Institute is to have, no matter what design or deliberation um, you're encountering, that the first question you would ask is what in the natural world has already solved what I'm trying to solve? And how can I emulate this in its form, in its process, in the whole system in which it fits. Because if our technologies emulate these technologies, they'll do something that's very, very different for us. But something that every species walking through that gauntlet has to figure out how to do. And that is to create conditions conducive to life. So enhancing the place that you live so that it will be able to support your offspring 10,000 years from now, that's the criteria for success for our technologies. So as we try to get ourselves now out of this emergency of our own making, I would suggest that we're not the first species to have faced an emergency on our planet. We're just in a long, long line of brilliance. <laughs> we're toddlers. We're extremely young. We've only been here 200,000 years, homo sapiens sapiens, versus 3.8 billion. So that's why it's so important for us to open our notebooks, to listen, to echo what we hear, to give thanks. So David, I want to thank you for having this nature bar here and reminding us of a different kind of relationship we can have with the natural world that begins and ends with respect. Thank you. <laughs>